Hello everyone, welcome back to my class. In the last class, we started module 7, wherein we talked about diffraction. We observed the, the similarities between interference and diffraction and then we talked about the different classes of diffraction wherein we saw that diffraction is uh, divided in two parts. The first is called Fraunhofer diffraction and the second is called Fresnel diffraction. Now today we start Fraunhofer diffraction and, and uh, just to revise, Fraunhofer diffraction is a class of uh, diffraction wherein both the source and the screen is effectively at infinity from the diffract, uh, diffracting element or from the uh, aperture plane. Now this is the usual case which we observe in with the aperture, we launch a plane wave here and then due to the aperture we see the formation of a spherical wave front and we see that light bends, yeah, this bending we usually we uh, name as diffraction. Now in Fraunhofer domain, we will generalize this case. Yeah, we know that in, uh, uh, from the Huygens principle that each point on the uh, wave front works as a secondary source. Okay. Now, if the light is being launched on the aperture, then each point on the upper, each point on the aperture will behave as a source of secondary wavelet. Okay. Now, to generalize this further, here we assume that we have a large number of point sources which are given here and all these point sources are separated by a distance is small d. Okay. And the point sources are very closely spaced and the observation point is very far from uh, these point sources and therefore we may assume that these point sources they are in phase okay. and the source uh, and the observation point, it, point is at a distance R1 from first source, R2 from second source, R3 from third source and Rn from nth source. Okay. Now uh, this is what is written here, the figure 9, in the last figure, uh, it depicts a linear array of n coherent point oscillator which are identical and each have same phase angle. Okay. The ray shown are almost parallel meeting at some very distant point P, yeah, make it a point, observation point P is very far from this point sources or point oscillators. Okay. If the spatial extent of array is comparatively small, thus the separate wave amplitudes arriving at P will be essentially equal, okay, having travelled nearly equal distances. Okay. Now suppose in this plane we have the point sources whose spatial extent like all these point sources lying within this uh, distance and the observation point is so far from uh, this uh, arrangement that this distance is negligible as compared to the distance from this point sources to the point of observation P. In that particular case we may assume that each individual source emits a ray which is reaching at point P and the amplitude from each source which is reaching at P is same and we also assume that all these point sources they are in the same phase. Okay. In, and in this circumstances E naught R1 which is the amplitude which is received at point P from uh, first point oscillator is equal to that of second point oscillator is equal to that of nth point oscillator and we assume that all these are equal to E naught R. Okay. Now the sum of interfering spherical wavelets yield an electric field at P given by real part of this expression. What does this expression re represent? This expression in complex representation represents the field received at point P from all these n number of point oscillators. The first oscillator uh, emits E naught R e to the power I k R1 minus omega t. Similarly, the second emit this uh, and the last one emit this. Okay, since we already assume that the amp amplitudes are the same, therefore these quantities are same here. Okay, now let us take e to the power minus I omega t and e to the power I k R1 out of the bracket. Then we are left with this series. 
okay now let us calculate the phase difference between adjacent sources okay now we know that the adjacent sources are separated by a distance d and how to calculate the phase difference phase difference is k naught into part difference okay and the part difference from the figure here we know that uh, the separation is d here and then the part difference would be this okay where this is the perpendicular which we draw from first ray path to the second ray path and this would be equal to d sin theta where theta is this angle okay with this we can write that optical part difference between the adjacent uh, rays is n d sin theta okay we will substitute it here to get phase difference and we also assume that this point oscillator are kept in a medium of refractive index n yeah therefore n is appearing here okay and therefore the ultimately the expression for phase uh, difference is k d sin theta where k is k naught into n okay now once this phase difference is known we can write it here k into r1 minus r2 is the phase difference okay therefore from equation uh, from figure 9a phase difference is k r2 minus r1 but what would be the phase difference between the first ray and the third ray let us go back into the figure this is the first ray and this is the third ray to calculate the phase difference we draw perpendicular here we join these two lines and angle here is again theta and now its total distance is 2d then the part difference would be 2d sin theta okay which is r3 minus r1 therefore phase difference the corresponding phase difference would be k naught into 2d sin theta well let us call it del 1 which would be equal to twice del del is nothing but it is k naught d sin theta but if you also take the refractive index of the medium then uh, it would be quite better yeah because uh, refractive index also plays a role in, it, in defining the part difference okay and this is what is done here okay the 2 del is equal to k r3 minus r1 this is the phase difference between first and three similarly between first and four you will get k r4 minus r1 okay and therefore you can replace the phases in uh, uh, occurring in this series okay the first will be del second would be 2 del third would be 3 del and last would be n minus 1 del okay now you see that this uh, series in the bracket it is in it is nothing but gp and we know the formula to add them up so if you add them up you get this term it is power i del n minus 1 by it is power i del minus 1. Let us simplify this a bit more then we can take it is power i n del by 2 out of the bracket from the numerator and from the denom denominator we take it is power i del by 2 out of the bracket. With this the bracketed term uh, get rearranged and we get equation number 6. Okay? This expression is familiar to us and uh, that we know that this is equal to this is nothing but e to the power i theta minus e to the power minus i theta by 2 i and then what is this this is your cos theta plus i sin theta minus cos theta uh, plus i sin theta by 2 i and this is equal to sin theta similarly with the denominator okay then we will exercise this formula here and this will result uh, this will result this term here yeah? this whole term will now reduce to this term okay because this bracket term in the numerator will reduce down to sin n del by 2 similarly bracket term bracketed term in the denominator will reduce down to sin del by 2 and this is nothing but it for i n minus 1 del by 2 okay this is this we got after solving the bracketed term in equation number 4 okay apart from this bracketed term we have this extra uh, multiplicative term let us take them also into account 
and then the final expression for the field at a point of observation now looks like this which is given by equation number 7. Okay. Now, now if we define capital R as the distance from the center of the oscillator to point P, then what would be the expression of capital R? Let us go back into the first figure. Now, here let us pick some point which is center, let us say that it is the center here and from the center the point P is at a distance R. Okay. Then if we have to draw to calculate the path length difference, we will have to draw a perpendicular from here on R. Okay. And as soon as I draw perpendicular from the first oscillator on R, then this distance will be equal to R1 okay? because this is the uh, and this is will be your extra path, this is optical path length difference. Okay? Hope this is clear. Now, since this point source is at the center of this oscillator array, therefore, this optical path length difference would be half of the optical path length difference between R1 and Rn. Okay? The point, uh, this is our array and R is at the center, okay, this is your R, this is your R1, this is your Rn and we drew this perpendicular from here to here. Therefore, this distance we say as R1 and this optical path length difference, this would be half of this. Okay. This, if this is total, then it would be total by 2. Okay. Therefore, capital R would be R1 plus total by 2. Okay. What is T? T is nothing but n minus 1 d sin theta. Okay. Therefore, the expression of capital R would be this, this is n minus 1 d sin theta which is optical path length difference between first and the last nth oscillator and we take half of this because R is the distance from the center of the line oscillator to the point P and R1 is the distance of the P from first point source. Okay, since we drew the perpendicular, then uh, before the perpendicular we have OPD, after the perpendicular we have R. Therefore, the addition of these two terms will give us capital R. Okay. Now, this term the right hand side of R is appearing here in equation number 7. Okay. Now, let us replace these things with capital R and the field expression get modified and we get this as equation number 9. Here you see that capital R is appearing in the exponent. Okay. Once the field is known, we need to calculate the flux density or irradiance. How to calculate this? The flux density, density distribution within the diffraction pattern due to n coherent identical distant point sources in a linear array would be proportional to E E E star by 2. Okay. This we know already and uh, to after the calculation we get this uh, expression for irradiance okay where i naught is the flux density from any single source we know that all these oscillators are identical then i naught is the irradiance or flux density of any of these uh, point oscillator okay now if you sub substitute n is equal to 0 in equation number 10 then you get uh, irradiance value or flux density value 0 okay? and which is very much obvious. If they, you have uh, no oscillator, no source, you will not get any irradiance at the point of observation P. But if the number of point uh, oscillator is 1, then I is equal to I naught which is again very much obvious because I naught is uh, the irradiance due to one source. Okay? But for n is equal to 2, you get 4 I naught cos squared L by 2. And if you remember this expression we have witnessed in Young's double set experiment. Okay. Now, the functional dependence of I on theta is more apparent if you express del, okay, if you expand del. 
ok del is your phase difference which is k d sin theta ok. Now, let us re replace del with k d sin theta in equation 10 we then we get equation number 11. In the numerator we have n k d by 2 sin theta while in the denominator we have k d by 2 sin theta and we are taking sin of these quantities ok. The sin square n k d by 2 sin theta term undergoes rapid fluctuations why because n is sitting here and is large number of oscillator okay. number of oscillator is n which is very large therefore the oscillations which the numerator will produce will be large ok the fluctuation is rapid here whereas in the denominator we have a function which is relatively slowly varying and therefore the this rapid fluctuations of numerator is modulating the slowly varying function which is sitting in the denominator ok and therefore what you will get ultimately if you plot uh, this equation number 11 then the combined expression give rise gives rise to a series of sharp principal peaks separated by small subsidiary maxima you will have several sharp peaks which would be separated by small maxima ok and what would be the position of maxima when will we get maxima the, it, the, the conventional trick is when the phase difference del is integral multiple of 2 pi we will get principal maxima ok if the direction theta in m is such that del is equal to 2 m pi where m is an integer we get maxima but del is equal to k d sin theta ok in terms of d sin theta this equation reduced to this expression d sin theta m is equal to n lambda the part difference must be integral multiple of wavelength ok. Now going back into equation 10 we see that in the numerator we have sin square n del by 2 and in the denominator we have sin square del by 2 how to, how to evaluate this because when del is equal to 0 both in the numerator and denominator we have 0 by 0 form. Here we exercise loss Peter rule ok, we will use this rule ok. In this rule we will differentiate both numerator and denominator with respect to the variable and after doing this we get n square the value of this ratio is equal to n square for del is equal to 2 m pi ok and from here we can easily calculate the irradiance the resultant irradiance which would be equal to n square i naught ok the principal maxima value would be equal to n square i naught ok as you increase the number of point sources as you increase the number of point oscillator the resultant irradiance at the screen at any point will increase rapidly how rapidly n square into i naught ok. Now <laughs> the system will radiate a maximum in a direction perpendicular to the array m is equal to 0 theta is equal to 0 and pi which is of course very much clear these are the point oscillator maxima will be here either here or here because the system is uh, emitting in uh, both the direction ok. Now as theta increases del increases and i falls off to 0 yeah you see phase is k d sin theta. So as you increase theta del will in increase and as del increases what will happen i will reduce down ok the irradiance will falls up and it will become uh, 0 when n del by 2 is equal to pi ok and this is the position of first minimum ok this is the condition for first minimum. Now just look into this expression d sin theta m is equal to m lambda in the right hand side we have fixed quantity. Now, if d is much much smaller than lambda just to just for the correctness of this equality sin theta now must be greater than 1 which is not possible ok. Therefore, for d smaller than lambda the only solution which exists is m is equal to 0 it therefore, in this case 
zero order principal maximum exist when d is less than lambda. Okay, only zero order principal mag maximum will exist when d is smaller than lambda. Now suppose that we have a system in which we can introduce an intrinsic phase shift of epsilon between adjacent oscillators. Okay. We, we, we started with a set of oscillators, set of linear oscillators which were oscillating in same phase and which were separated by a distance d. Okay. Now what we are saying is that the adjacent oscillators are now shifted in phase by epsilon. Okay. Then therefore, the phase difference between the waves emitting, emitting from the adjacent source will have contribution from the path length difference and will have contribution from the initial phase difference. Okay. And this epsilon represents the initial phase difference between the adjacent oscillators. Okay. Therefore, we will sum up these two contribution to come up with, with an expression of the resultant phase difference. Okay. Therefore, the condition of uh, maxima which is d sin t time is equal to m lambda will get modified and uh, it will uh, modify to equation number 15 d sin t time is equal to m lambda minus epsilon by k. Therefore, the angular direction of the maxima now becomes a function of epsilon the initial phase. Okay. It means with the addition of some initial phase or deliberate addition of initial phase, we can tilt whole fringe pattern. We can tilt or we can uh, manipulate the position of central maxima or principal maxima. Okay. Now, concentrating on the central maximum which is m is equal to 0, we can vary its orientation theta naught at will by merely adjust, adjusting the value of epsilon. Okay. Now, let us consider uh, another case or a bit uh, idealized case. Now, right now, till now we were considering point oscillators which were separated by certain distance d. But what if this d is extremely small? Okay. If d is extremely small, then this array of line oscillator can be termed as line source. Okay. Now, consider an idealized line source of electron oscillators as shown in figure 10. Now, here these are the point oscillators which are very closely spaced. Okay, almost touching each other, the d the separation is infinitesimally small now. Okay. We are, they are almost touching, therefore, we can safely say line charge. Okay. And the overall, overall length of this line charge is capital D. Okay. This is capital D and they are placed at the center here. Okay. And since O is origin, the, the line charge is placed at origin in the vertical up direction the length of the line charge is d by 2 in vertical down, down direction the length of this line charge element is also d by 2. Okay. Axis is pointing in this direction, y axis is pointing vertically up and z is coming out of the plane of the paper. Now, also assume a point of observation p here which is at a distance capital R away from origin O and when you join p with O then this line makes an angle theta with x axis. Okay. Now, each point emits a spherical wave front yeah, each point on the line source now will emit a spherical wave front and how to write the expression of the field for uh, this spherical wave front by this relation epsilon naught by r sin omega t minus k r. Epsilon naught is amplitude, r is the distance. We know that as you go away from the point charge, from the source point, the field will decay down. Okay. Therefore, r is sitting in the denominator and the usual phase function the sine. Okay. And epsilon naught is the amplitude, the source strength. 
okay. Now the present situation is distinct from the previous figure, from the previous analysis where we were having this uh, point oscillators. Now what is the difference? The difference is that here the sources are very weak, their number n is tremendously large, huge number of sources are here and the separation between them is vanishingly small. Okay. Since we are calling them as a line source, therefore the separation is vanishingly small. Okay. Now if the d is entire length of the array, then segment delta y i will contain delta y i n by d sources. Okay. Now suppose this is the your line element which is emitting and then out of in this line element we choose a segment of length y i. Okay. Now the total number of point sources on this line segment is n and total length is d. Therefore, number of point sources per unit length would be n by d which is number of point sources per unit length. Okay, once the number of point sources per unit length is known, then in length element delta y i, the number of point sources would be delta y i into n by d. Okay. Now imagine that array is divided into m such segments. Okay. This was the segment which we were considering and in this segment we took delta y i. Now assume that there are m number of such segment here. The total number of segment is m and total number of point sources is n, capital N. Okay. Now the contribution to the electric field intensity at P from the ith segment is E i is equal to epsilon naught by R i sin omega t minus k into R i into this n delta y i upon d. Okay. n delta y i upon d represents the number of point sources in length element delta y i or in segment delta y i. Okay, and this is contribution from single point source and therefore we have to multiply the contribution from the one source into the number of sources in length element y i. Okay. But while doing so we have assumed that in length element y i or in segment y i the segment is so small that the point sources are oscillator which is lying in this segment have negligible relative phase difference. This r i is constant for all oscillators lying within delta y i, r i is independent of y i. If we fix, if we take a particular segment, then within that seg segment r i is constant. Okay. And we also assume they are in same phase. Therefore, we also assume, uh, assume that their field add constructively. Okay. Now, since the separation is vanishingly small and n is very huge, the number of oscillators is huge. Therefore, we can use calculus for more complicated geometry. Okay, we will see how to use it. Now, we are observing electric field strength at a point of observation p and this electric field st strength will be resultant of the electric field contribution from n number of point source which is there within uh, a line uh, within a line source which is of length d. But if we assume that n is approaching towards infinity then each point source lying on this line source the strength of all individual point source must diminish nearly to 0. Why is it so? Because if they are contributing hugely and n is infinity then at the point of observation we will receive infinite field. Okay, because the point sources are infinite and they have some finite value of strength. Therefore, as n approaches to infinity the strength of individual source must approach to 0. Okay, because we want to we want the total output to be finite. 
okay, total output must be finite. Okay. Therefore, we can define a constant epsilon L as source strength per unit length. Okay. This will resolve the problem of uh, infinite field at observation point P. Okay. What the, how to define source strength per unit length? It can be defined like this. We have total number of sources n and strength of each source is epsilon naught. That therefore, total strength would be epsilon naught into n. Since L is in, uh, in uh, uh, increasing to infinity, under this limit if we divide it with the d, then it gives a strength of the source per unit length and which is uh, given by equation number 18, epsilon this is how is epsilon L is defined. Okay. Once epsilon L is defined, then we can, we can express the total field at point of observation P from all the segment okay? and we know that we have m number of segment and delta y i is one of uh, such segments. Okay? We will sum over i now. Okay? Now, this is the expression for one of the segment and we now sum over i, i varies from 1 to m, okay? m is the number of segment. Oh, and Okay. Now, since the length of the segment is very small, then the number of segment would also be very huge and therefore, we can replace the summation with integration and this is what exactly is done in equation number 20. The summation is replaced by this integration and since the length element the line element is of length d there of course the integration limit will vary from minus d by 2 to plus d by 2 because line element is placed at the center and half of its length is uh, above in positive y direction and half of its uh, length is in negative y direction okay therefore uh, the limit would be from minus d by 2 to plus d by 2 number of the length element is uh, increasing till uh, to infinity it is in uh, it is infinitesimal therefore delta y i goes to dy and uh, where r which is sitting in the denominator and here it would be a function of y okay now here the approximation used to evaluate the above integral must depend upon the position of p Okay, because r is here, okay, which is a function of y, okay, and therefore this expression 20 it makes the distinction between Fraunhofer and Fresnel diffraction because to solve 20 we will have to make some approximation. We will be either in the Fraunhofer domain or Fresnel domain, which depends upon r, okay, or which depend upon the finiteness of the source. Okay, how big the uh, length of the line source is. I stop here. Thank you for listening to me.